Hi, my name is Bill Nelson. This will be a presentation on boards of review. We'll cover regular rank boards of review and eagle boards of review. First, let's talk about where you can get more information. You can learn more about boards of review at the Guide to Advancement. And in fact, the Guide to Advancement is your official source, definitive source for policies and procedures in the BSA related to advancement of all programs. In our slides, you will see a green number at the top. In this slide, it's 1.0.0.0. That is the chapter and section where we are getting the policy or procedure that we are talking about in the presentation. So everything is coming out of the Guide to Advancement. Uh, it's available online, and I give you the link on the slide. Uh, and it's also available as a PDF that you can download. Uh, it's also available, I think, still at the Scout store. Uh, you can purchase a hard copy of it for around $10. If you have questions concerning boards of review, first check the Guide to Advancement. There's an entire chapter on boards of review in the Guide to Advancement, and another chapter on the whole Eagle Scout process. If you can't find your answer there, contact the Council Advancement Team, and we are available at gccadvancement1 at gmail.com. Finally, if you don't get your answer in either of those places, you can contact the National Advancement Program Team, and they're reachable by emailing advancement.team at scouting.org. There are four steps in Scouts BSA Advancement. First, the Scout learns something. They learn how to tie a knot, they learn something about the flag. They learn about something. Then the scout is tested. Now this is the most important step. It is a responsibility of the scoutmaster to do this test. He, he or she can delegate it to somebody else, but the responsibility stays with the scoutmaster to make sure the test is done properly. Because it's only done once in uh, Scouts BSA Advancement, you don't retest. So once a a scout passes a test and is signed off. We call it signing off when somebody initials their book uh, or records it in a scout book as approved or an internet advancement, that that, that that requirement is completed and the scout has been tested and has passed the test. So let's say it's a knot tying, you may want to wait a week, right? You may want to have them to tie the knot one week and get tested a week later to make sure that they've retained a little bit. But you can't uh, sign them off and then six months later uh, ask them to re-tie uh, the knot again. And if they can't tie the knot, you take that requirement away from them. Or in a board review, definitely you can't retest them. So the testing is done uh, by the Scoutmaster so their their responsibility, and uh, it is after the scout has learned a skill or whatever the requirement is. So a scout is tested is the second step. The third step is the scout is reviewed. For rank requirements, that's the job of the board of review, and we'll be talking about that. For the um, merit badges, the review occurs by the Merit Badge Counselor and by a quick uh, Scoutmaster conference. Uh, so go to Merit Badge Counselor training to find out more about what happens at a Merit Badge. But we don't review Merit Badges at a unit or Eagle border review. And a scout is recognized. And normally we recognize a scout with a badge. We try to recognize them as quickly as we can. Uh, and um, that is the final step of the four steps of advancement. We'll go over some questions now that are uh, common in the Scouts BSA program. First one will be reasonable expectation. What does reasonable expectation mean? You will see in the Guide to Advancement that we refer to reasonable expectation. And that deals with a Scouts level of activity 
and whether a scout has fulfilled the position of responsibility, you will see that we will refer to reasonable expectations. What it means is that an objective third party who is reviewing your decision in that event, in that action that you did, will consider that reasonable. In a number of requirements, there is a statement that says the scout must be active in their troop and patrol for a certain period of time, three months, six months. That's called active participation. It's separate than position of responsibility. There's a different requirement that says you have to be in a position of, require, of responsibility for a certain length of time. So putting our blinders on and just looking at active participation and that requirement, what does it mean to be active in your unit? Well, there are three tests. The first two are administrative and the third is a little more detailed. So the first test is the scout's registered. The scout is actually registered in the unit. The second one is the scout is in good standing with the unit. The troop hasn't kicked them out. The Boy Scouts of America hasn't kicked them out. So those first two tests are administrative tests. The third test is that the scout meets the unit's reasonable expectations. There we are again with that word reasonable again. Or if not, a lesser level of activity is explained. So the unit has to advertise what the reasonable expectations are. They can establish that in a troop guide uh, document, uh, troop bylaw, uh, bylaws, but they must communicate it to all the parents and all the scouts, and they must treat everyone equally. Reasonable means that given that the scout is doing other things in their life, than scouting, is it reasonable to expect the scout to do whatever it is that you're asking them to do? For example, attend 50% of the outings. 50% of the outings may be reasonable. 100% of the outings, and to insist that a scout attend 100% of the outings is probably unreasonable. So again, reasonable is what a third party would think is reasonable if they looked on what your expectation is. So if the scout meets that, then they are considered active. The second part of that third test is an or. So if they, they don't meet the first part, well, they can meet the second part and still be considered active. The second part says, if not, a lesser level of activity is explained. Now, what is a lesser level of activity? A lesser level of activity is they can't make the meetings because they're in sports. Since sports contributes to the character of a person and character building is one of the missions of scouting, then that is a reasonable lesser activity and it's explained so the scout could still be considered active. If the scout is in band or is a section leader in band or is a leader in their ch church, all of those are uh, explain the lesser level of activity and can be counted as, as a uh, active participation because all of those contribute to the mission of scouting, which is to build moral character. Playing video games at home does not explain this uh, lesser level of activity and so would not count as active participation because it doesn't necessarily contribute to the mission of scouting. Here's an example. It says Jill Scout is a star scout and is an assistant senior patrol leader in a troop, a sophomore in high school, an order of the Arrow Lodge officer, a high school tennis team starter, a youth group leader in her church. At her board of review for life, Jill indicates that she has not been able to attend all the troop meetings. Should she still be considered active? Well, under the previous rule that we just explained, she would be considered active. 
So this is an example of somebody who could not attend the troop meetings, but can explain that her absence was because she was very involved with other things that build moral character. Another requirement that a Board of Review should look at is the demonstration of Scout Spirit. Well, what is Scout Spirit? Scout Spirit is not liking scouting or be enthusiastic about scouting or wanting to advertise scouting or being a good example of scouting. That's not Scout Spirit. What Scout Spirit is, is this living the oath and law in their daily life. That is how we measure Scout Spirit. If for some reason the Scout egregiously violates the Scout oath or law, then they are in, um, they are not meeting this requirement. And I'll give you some examples. A scout that steals or sells drugs or beats people up would not demonstrate scout spirit and they would not be able to pass their rank because they didn't satisfy scout spirit. So this is your opportunity to say, I don't want to pass this scout because this scout is a real bad person and we don't want to have bad people in as Eagle Scouts. And, and so you hold them up, uh, you go back to the Scoutmaster and say, hey, take a look at this scout, put them on probation for a period of time until their behavior changes. And then we can look at them again. Now this is inside of scouting and outside of scouting. They could be ideal people in a meeting, but when they go home, they're beating up their sister or brother. In that case, they're still violating scout spirit. So what is a service project? A service project is something that a person does that gives benefit to someone else without personal compensation. So if you have somebody who is doing something good uh, for someone else, but they get paid for it, so it's basically fundraising, that is not a service project. That is uh, an active activity, but it wouldn't be a service project. Service projects as a regular part of the program need to be approved uh, as written in uh, the requirements by the scout leader. So usually it says in the requirements that after getting approval for these service projects, you do them or service projects approved by your scout master or something like that. They don't necessarily have to be done prior you don't have to have a permission prior to the service project, but for it to count, the, the scoutmaster has to agree, yes, that's, that's a service project. Okay, I told you we'd talk about positions of responsibility. Well, here's the slide for positions of responsibility. There is in the requirement for the rank, and, and some ranks are different, life positions of responsibility, uh, and eagle positions of responsibility and star positions of responsibility may differ what which those jobs are. So take a look at the requirement for the particular rank that you're evaluating. The position of responsibility must be one that is actually written in the requirement. You can't substitute it with leadership in the church, uh, leadership at school, or anything like that. So normally it would be exactly what is written in the requirement. That is the position of responsibility. And it's usually something like senior patrol leader or patrol leader. Um, now, what does the person have to do for the time to count? Well, they have to do something, okay, first off. If they do absolutely nothing, then the time is not counted. You count the amount of time that they're in the position until the leader has removed them from the position, until the scoutmaster has removed them from the position. Now, and that even 
even if the troop is not meeting, that time counts. So like if the troop doesn't meet during the summer, that time still counts towards the position of the responsibility. What do they have to do in the position of the responsibility? Well, they have to do what the troop and the, has expecting them to do as communicated to them and the rest of the troop by the scoutmaster. If the troop or the scoutmaster does not give them instructions on what to do, then whatever the scout thinks is the response is the responsibility is that counts. So if the scout is a librarian and the scout thinks all they have to do is put all the merit badge uh, books in alphabetical order and that's their job and you don't tell them anything different, then they've met the expectation. If you have communicated a much bigger job and they have not done it, then the scoutmaster's responsibility, and notice I always say scoutmaster, because with, with advancement, the responsibility is on the shoulder of the scoutmaster. The scoutmaster has to communicate to the scout that they are not doing, uh, fulfilling the job requirements. And after a warning or two, if the scout still isn't doing it, it's the responsibility of the scoutmaster to remove that scout from the position. If they do not remove the scout, then the time counts as long as the scout has done something. Often we get the question, does a single activity count for more than one re requirement? For example, camping. Can camping count for the camping merit badge, a camp out, and also for um, first class camping? Well, it can, as long as whatever that activity is matches the requirement exactly. So whatever the scout does matches the requirement exactly, then it can count for multiple requirements for multiple things, merit badges and ranks. Unless the requirement specifically says it can't count. For example, cooking merit badge says first class cooking cannot count for cooking merit badge. So you have to do separate set of cooking. Um, also be very careful with what the requirement says. There is a requirement in communications merit badge and in citizenship in the community that can be met by attending a, a city council meeting. However, what the scout has to bring back from the city council meeting is different in citizenship in the community than it is in communications merit badge. So, just because they went to a city council meeting, if they can't discuss with the with the uh, merit badge counselor what that requirement wants them to discuss, then they cannot have that. The um, you can't check them off that they've they've accomplished that requirement. So don't just say okay, since they did this one thing, we'll automatically like a computer program credit them for this other thing. The requirements have to be. Uh, looked at first. No one is allowed to change requirements. No council, committee, district, unit, or individual has the authority to add or subtract from advancement requirements. There are limited exceptions relating only to members with special needs. If that is a situation in your unit, please reach out to the council advancement team and we can advise you or look in the guide to advancement for more information. Okay, so when do you hold a board of review? Board of review must be granted when requirements are met or when the scout believes they've completed the requirements. So when it becomes apparent to a unit leader uh, then the unit must offer a board of review to the scout. It is not the scout's responsibility to ask for a board of review. And you cannot 
wait until that happens. If you know the scout's ready, you must offer them the opportunity for a board of review. You can't put it off. You must hold it within a reasonable period of time. And that's defined by the BSA as within one month. So if your troop doesn't meet in the summer and the scout's ready at the end of May for voter review, you can't put them off until September. You have to offer them a voter review in within a month. You cannot ask a scout to exceed what is in the requirements for a border review or to advance in rank. As we mentioned before, you cannot change the requirements. So you can't add to a requirement that says something like, uh, for to be star scout, you must be 13 years of age. There is no requirement uh, to be 13 years of age to be a star scout and you cannot add such a requirement that would be against bsa policy so once the scout has done the requirements as written they are ready for border review okay who should sit on the border review we would like between three to six members uh, to sit on the border review uh, they need to be at least 21 years of age we would like them to be from the unit committee but that does is not a hard requirement. Uh, unit leaders who are scout, and that's another word for scoutmasters, and assistants, assistant scoutmasters, shall not sit on a board of review uh, because one of the aspects of board of review is to evaluate the program and give feedback to the committee and the scoutmaster on the program for, as viewed by the scout. Uh, so we don't want unit leaders and assistants sitting on the board of review uh, because they wouldn't be objective. Uh, a parent or guardian shall not serve on a board of review for their own child. Whether or not um, they can uh, audit a board of review, uh, there's no secret meetings in the Boy Scouts of America. However, uh, they cannot vote on the board of review. The candidate, parent, or guardian shall not select members that are sitting on the board. They have no input on that. The board of review is selected by the unit committee. Uniforming. Uniforms are preferred. The field uniform is what a lot of people call the Class A uniform. However, there are times where a scout may not be able to be in a full Class A uniform. Uh, it could be that they're coming in from a sports activity, so they're going to be wearing their sports uniform or a band activity, uh, and they just don't have enough time to change. They could be out on a camp out. Uh, there could be a number of reasons why they cannot be in a uh, Class A uniform. Uh, you cannot require them to purchase anything to have a board review. So if they're missing, if they outgrow their pants, you can't require them to purchase new pants, for example, to attend your board review. Uh, in, the, in cases like that, they, they dress neatly and as cleanly as possible. Uh, and, um, you know, uh, things that they would wear for church maybe would be a, a way of guiding them. Okay, let's talk about conducting the board review. Uh, remember that uh, unit leader parents and guardians are not allowed on the board review. They can audit it, uh, but they cannot uh, be on the board. Remember that a board is not a retest. Uh, there is no retesting on a board review. You can't hand them a rope and say tie a knot. Um, it is uh, not meant to be a challenge of the scout's knowledge. You can't tell them, for ex ask them, for example, who was the founder of the Boy Scouts of America. Uh, and if they fail it, they fail the board of review. Um, it, it, those are not really purposeful questions anyway, what you want to do is you want to focus on their activity in the unit, how they are doing, if they are progressing in advancement, um, what obstacles they're finding, and uh, what benefits scouting is giving to their life. Don't expect perfection. 
uh, these fo these kids are young. Uh, they are not. This is not a job interview. Uh, so don't expect them to you know, kind of live up to some sort of expectations. Um, be positive and just ask them questions dealing with their scouting journey. Now we're going to get ready to vote. Before you vote, you'd have to say, well, what what am I voting on if I'm not going to ask to retest them? Well, you're going to make sure a, a few things. One thing you want to make sure of is that uh, everything in the book uh, or in Scout Book has been signed off and signed off by somebody who is authorized to sign them off, authorized by the Scout Master. Remember, the Scout Master has the responsibility for advancement in the unit. Signing off means they've been tested. They actually have tested in front of this person and this person has said, yep, they can do this thing. Once they've done it, they did it once, they don't have to do it again. If they've done a, a test, and they've passed it and gotten signed off, then they never in the Boy Scout requirements have to retest that skill again. It doesn't mean that you don't put that skill in your program so that you they learn it and, and make it part of their knowledge base that they retain the rest of their life, whatever that skill might be, but you don't retest them as far as advancement is concerned. Once the scout has tied a bowline and the person who's testing them said, yep, at this point in time, this scout can tie that bowline and they sign them off, then it's done and what's done is done. So testing is very important. Um, you know, you may want to wait a week from the time that they learned the skill to the time that you test them so that you make sure that they actually have gone some sort of retention. But we don't really expect them to retain something for six months or two years or three years, at least not part of the requirements. This is all just requirements and advancement. Um, it has nothing to do with maybe what you want to do in your program. If you think that a, a bowling knot is a uh, knot that they absolutely have to retain for the rest of their life, then build it in your program to do it over and over and over again. Okay, so we're not retesting. So what are we doing? We're asking them questions to see if they've done what they said the, the person who signed them off said they did. Sometimes a person will sign a scout off even if the scout has never done it. And that can happen if there's like 20, 10 books in front of the person signing off and they just said, well, I'm going to sign all there, all these scouts are present at this meeting or at this camp out. I'm going to just sign them all off on building a camp gadget because we built a camp gadget on the camp out. Well, maybe that scout never did build a camp gadget. Maybe he was walking or uh, she was you know, not paying attention or whatever and didn't do the camp gadget. So how can you tell if the person did the camp gadget or not, even though it's signed off? Well, you can ask questions like, what was the camp gadget that you signed off on that you built for this requirement? And if they can't tell you what it was, then maybe you know you talk to them a little bit and maybe they'll say, well, I never did do it. If they didn't do it, and your requirement wasn't si was not signed off correctly, then you could go back to the scoutmaster and say, well, we this scout has to get this requirement done before we'll pass him on the board of review. And that's your job, kind of a quality control, make sure that those sort of things did occur. Um, once you've gone through all of those things, you can talk to the scout about their future in scouting, kind of encourage them to to uh, do more advancing and and talk about the you know the future ranks that they have. Talk to them about how did they like the campouts that the troop goes on and other activities that the troop does. What would they change in the troop if the, if they had the ability to change something? Kind of questions like that. Feel them out what the, they think of the program and what they would like to have change because often this is their only opportunity to give quality feedback to the unit committee. And then the board of review is adjourned for a period of time, 
five minutes, 10 minutes. And you ask the scout to step out um, of the room while you vote. And then you have to all agree that the scout can advance in rank. Again, if they did the requirements, then you really can't say no unless they, for some reason, their scout spirit was bad, but that means they did not complete that requirement of scout spirit. So if they did the requirements and you kind of have to say yes, that they, they did it, we're going to go ahead and advance them. It has to be unanimous. If it's not unanimous, then they don't, uh, they don't advance. If for some reason somebody on the board of review knows ahead of time that they're not going to vote for the scout because they, they don't like their scout spirit, uh, for example, then they need to talk to the scoutmaster ahead of time and not embarrass the scout of to that the scout flunks the the border review. Take care of it ahead of time. Don't don't take care of it at the end. Um, now let's say a scout didn't complete a requirement. You could say, well, we're going to adjourn the border review for two weeks while you go get this you know camp gadget built. And then we'll have the board of review again. And when we do the board of review again, we'll just start up where we left off. You don't have to redo the whole thing. If for some reason you do, uh, you do deny a scout, you need to write up in a letter telling the scout and their parents, as well as the scoutmaster, exactly what that scout would have to do to pass a board of review so that there's no mystery it's written down once the scout does that they come back and you do another board of review they've gotten that done and now they can pass okay can you do video conferencing well yes you can do a board of review by video conferencing when there are exceptional reasons for it uh, during 2020, we have the pandemic, and so a lot of people cannot meet in person. Uh, in, those, in that case, we did uh, do video conferencing. Um, if a, for some reason some member of the board is traveling, it could be the scout, it could be you know, one of the members, you could do it by video conferencing as well for that. So don't be afraid of video conferencing. If you do it, um, uh, then uh, make sure everybody is visible uh, on the conference uh, so that the scout can see the people of the board and the board can see the scout. Let's talk about some things that are particular to the Eagle Scout Board of Review. Uh, it can be done at the unit district or council level. We almost never do it at the council level. It's almost always done at the district level. Uh, a unit can do, have it done at the unit if there are, if it's organized by a district person, a district person who is not a member of the unit must attend the board, must be on the board of review and kind of coordinating it. Um, however, by and far, they're done by the district and they're done at the district uh, level. Uh, again, no uh, fewer than three and no more than six members over the age of 21. Uh, it should not occur until the EGLE application has been verified by the district verifier that tells the person, um, yep, we went through everything, they duly registered, all of the badges have been recorded in scout book or internet advancement. Um, there's not going to be any question about paperwork. The, the booklet's done for the for the um, the scout project, and uh, the person's good to go. So when that when that verification happens, that's the job of the verifier. Then the board review for Eagle, they don't have to worry about whether or not that person's registered. They are. They don't have to worry about whether or not uh, the stuff is in ScoutNet or Scout Book or Internet Advancement, the stuff is. Uh, what they need to look at then is they concentrate mostly on the project. Was the project done? And if the, the Scout did what they said they were going to do, then they the board passes them on the project. Um, because what they said they were going to do, and they got signed off by the Eagle approver, 
at the very beginning of the process of the project, uh, if they if they were committing to doing that and they did that and they got signed off by the unit, the beneficiary and the district approver for that project and that's what they did, then you pretty much have to accept it on the Eagle side. If they may, if uh, if they made a lot of changes to it uh, and didn't tell anybody, and now the project scope has really been reduced, uh, then at that point you might be able to say, you know, that the project was not completed as approved, uh, originally approved. Um, we asked for reference letters uh, in our council, but the thing you need to understand is that the reference letters and following up on references are really the responsibility of the Eagle Board of Review. It, they are not the responsibility of the scout. The scout does not have to provide letters of reference. Uh, if they do not provide letters of reference, somebody on the district, Eagle Board of Review, should be calling the references that are on the Eagle application to verify that they are in, you know, they are truly references, and that they give the scout a good reference. If you cannot cannot uh, find somebody and they're not responsive, then you still have to do the border review. You can't say, well, we got to keep waiting because this person is never responding to us. An Eagle Border Review should not last any more than 30 minutes to 45 minutes. Yes, it's more involved than a rank border review, but it should not be a inquisition. If anybody starts making it longer than 45 minutes, it should be the scout bragging about their project. If a uh, Eagle Board of Review occurs after they are 18, uh, it's fine. As long as they have done all of the requirements except the paperwork prior to their 18th birthday. Paperwork can be done after their 18th birthday, but all the requirements must be done, including the Scoutmaster Conference, prior to their 18th birthday. Then within three months, they can you know, they can do a board review without any problem. Uh, up to six months, we have uh, approved uh, the district approval for boards review. So basically, the scout has up to six months to get it done after they've turned 18. And then beyond six months, it takes nationals approval to um, for them to have a board review after their 18th birthday beyond six months, so after they're 18 and a half. Try to avoid that as much as possible. It is a big procedure to get that per that permission. Um, and we do not, uh, we really don't want to have to go through all that gyration and nobody wants to have to go through all of that if we can avoid it. Uh, during the COVID pandemic, we have had some e uh, uh, three month extensions that have been automatic uh, to get a project completed. Uh, those uh, are a kind of an exceptional thing uh, and kind of outside of the scope of this, but, but just know that there was that during the pandemic. Now let's say somebody didn't think that the scout should go to an Eagle Board of Review. The unit leader, it could be anybody, it could be the committee chair, it could be anybody who needs to sign off, refuses to sign off, but the scout feels that they have done the requirements and they can, they should be made Eagle. You can do that. Uh, you take under consideration the fact that the unit leader or whoever it was did not approve and you ask for some sort of feedback from that person who is not approving. Uh, if uh, the scout still has completed all the requirements, remember that's the thing on boards of review that the, the scout re has completed the requirements. If the scout has completed the requirements, then you have to pass them on a board of review. Now, if let's say you don't pass a scout on a border review, for all the lower ranks, if you don't pass a scout, they can retake a border review. So boards of review for the lower ranks can be taken over and over and over again. For Eagle, uh, there is uh, 
an appeal process, you only can do an Eagle Board of Review once. If the if the Eagle Board of Review, uh, they can adjourn and say, hey, get this thing finished and then come back and we will reconvene and finish the Board of Review, that, that's allowed. But if you say, absolutely, we have voted and we have voted no, then the only recourse the scout has is to appeal. And they would appeal uh, to the uh, district initially and the district would then uh, put together an appeals board to look at it. They only look at what the specific thing that the border review denied. So again, on the Eagle side, if you do a border review, you need to write up. If you say no, you need to write it up why you said no. And it has to be uh, advancement related. It cannot be for any other reason but something advancement related. Uh, if if it is and, and you write it up, then the district can assemble a board a appeals board and look at it. They if they uh, agree with the scout that he should be passed, then they just process the paperwork as normal. If they agree with the Eagle Board and deny the uh, advancement, then the scout can appeal to council. And we can and we'll do the same thing. Uh, we'll assemble a uh, appeals board uh, and look at it. Uh, national gets involved at that point, and the national makes the final decision, yes or no, on advancement to Eagle in that situation. That's it for the presentation on boards of review. Uh, we hope that you enjoyed the presentation and that it was beneficial to you. Um, we also hope you have a great scouting um, experience and have great boards of review.